Hallelujah. I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. I want to welcome our partners and friends all over the world that's watching today. It's already been a great 11th hour. I think it's already been very, very good today. So you need to go ahead and embrace the good today. Don't let anybody talk down to you today. Just, just don't let it sink into you. Don't, don't let it, don't, don't take it to heart. Don't, don't listen to this negativity where people are trying to drive you down. The Lord has made you more than a conqueror. That's more than a conqueror. You know what a more than a conqueror is? I heard this story told one time, and I heard it told about this certain boxer, but but, you know, I, I just, one of my favorite boxers that was of all time was Evander Holyfield. And I just liked, I, the size of his fist was absolutely amazing. Man, it looked as wide as that microphone, you know. And, uh, you know, and it's just a story, you know, told it. I think he made $30 million on one of his fights. And, and you know, his, and he's a conqueror. And everybody talks about he's a conqueror. And he is a conqueror, and he conquered, and he won, and he got that check. And he comes in bruised and beat up and everything else, and he walks in there, and he tells his wife, Hi, honey, I'm home. And he has this check in his hand, and he's a conqueror. And she walks up and takes the check out of his hand, and now she is more than a conqueror. <laughs> I mean, she now has the benefits of the war that he went through. Hallelujah. And that's Jesus. He come out of that tomb after three days and nights, spending those three days and nights in hell. He paid the ultimate price for you and I. He absolutely became sin for us. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, was made to be sin with our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he went into hell. He paid the price of a sinner, though he had never committed one. After three days and nights, the sin stayed in hell, but he came up out of hell, and he came out of there, those scars in his hands, on his head, the hole in his side, on his hole in his feet. He comes out of there. He is a conqueror. But then he says, now you go and cast out the devil. And he said, you are more than a conqueror. In other words, he gave you the benefits of everything he did battle to, to achieve. Amen. Because he didn't need it for himself. He got it for us. Praise God. Now, James talks about the rudder of a great ship talks about though it be small it can turn about a whole great ship you know the rudder in comparison to the ship is small because that ship must turn slowly now in those old days the ships had this giant wheel and they would turn this wheel now this rudder was huge but in comparison to this giant boat it was very small and so the rudder was, was engineered just right to where when it turned, it would display so much water, turn the water just enough that that giant ship would slowly start turning. Because it wasn't like a speedboat or a jet ski. You know, you go down there on a jet ski, whoa, and just turn it up, man, kicking up water everywhere and turn a boat all the way around and slide it in, you know, like you're a Miami Vice guy and you can, whoa, roaring that boat in. You can't do a giant ship that way. If a giant ship turned all at once, it would, it would kill everything on it probably. It would probably break the ship apart. It would throw everything on it out in the ocean. You can't do it. It has to turn slowly, and especially when it was a wooden boat in those days, these big boats. So they would turn the wheel all the way around till it stopped, and that rudder would turn. And they would hold that thing. And for a long time, it looked like nothing was happening. It'd just go straight. Nothing was taking place. And then suddenly they would notice that it's slowly starting to turn. And if you don't let go of the wheel, it'll eventually turn all the way around and go the other direction. But it has to turn slow so that everything aboard the ship can adjust to what, it's, what that turn is and how that turn works. Now, that's the way prophecy works. That's the way the prophetic works. 
It's the same way with prophecy. People, you know, hear prophecy and they think immediately, oh, it surely it all just happen. It all just turn like that. It all just happen. It all just whip itself around and be done. Well, see, there's so much connected to, especially turning a nation. If you're going to turn nations toward God, if all at once what the prophet said just went, boom, and turned it just like that. I mean, a lot of times, my friends, it would tear everything apart. And so prophets, the, James talked about your tongue being like that rudder. You have to hold it. You have to, when a prophecy is given, the prophetic word has to keep, keep on being spoken, 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 spoken. You have to keep declaring it. You start declaring it. You do a war with that prophecy. And you just keep going and keep going. And then eventually you'll notice it'll start turning. And it's, but it was given at the moment with such conviction because that prophet went into the future, saw it all, came back to the now and told you with such conviction that it was right there. And everybody said, yeah, oh, yeah, surely it's got to happen now. <clears throat> I remember when Mike Pence could have done, you know, said what he said and, and ended everything that time. But he didn't do it, and uh, I remember a man was standing around, and he said, what do we do now? What do we do now? I said, the Lord will raise up deliverance from somewhere else if he has to. Because deliverance, it wasn't that it wasn't going to come. And it still may come through that same man. You don't know, what, you don't know any of that yet right now. But it's going to come. <clears throat> remember Mordecai told Esther, said, if you don't step up to the plate, he said, that deliverance will come from another place, but you and your father's house will not be saved. So deliverance is coming. It's not that it's not going to come. The nation of the United States is going to turn. It will turn. <clears throat> as long as, as we're this side of the rapture of the church, it is not going that direction. Not on our watch. And the prophetic words the Lord has given us are still as sure as the day he gave it to us. Well, what about Trump? Well, what about him? What about him? If they held the election right now in the next 20 minutes, he'd be, he'd be right back in office again if it wasn't crooked. I mean, everybody. Nobody likes Booster. Everybody likes Turbo Man. They don't like Booster. And Booster ain't even, he's not, he's not, he shouldn't be there. Booster. Well, oh yeah, he, he, uh, the only person that could keep Trump out of office is Trump. That's it. Because he's, his destiny is back. It's back there. It's where he, because in heaven he never left. And the only person could ever keep him out of it, it'd be if he just said, I'm not going. So what you have to understand is when prophecy is given, prophecy steps in. You know, I, uh, Abraham, the New Testament talks about how Abraham left searching for a country uh, or, or city that hath foundations. He saw the new Jerusalem, and he went out hunting it. It was so real to him that he went out, thought he was going to find a city that already was built and had foundations in this promised land. That's why the Bible said he came into the promised land, said he went out for the promised land, and he came into the promised land, and he went straight through the promised land, headed to Egypt. Because the Egypt was the biggest city around. Then he comes back and realizes, wait a minute, it's here. I arrived in the future. It's here. I saw something else. And so he began to establish the land. Now, it was the land of his covenant, and nobody will ever take it from Israel. Now, as a matter of fact, it will increase as time goes. So it's the same way with prophecy. Prophecy uh, is, is spoken with such intensity that they think surely it will happen tonight. Yet, if it, if it did, 
there'd be so much connected to it, especially with turning a nation, uh, concerning a nation, it would rip the nation apart. So you hold fast that wheel. You keep that rudder turned. And you let it all adjust as it turns. And who don't need to be on the boat will get off the boat. But by the time it turns around, it's right. Hallelujah. The prophecy came from the future, but it was it but it was heard or seen so clearly that it was spoken as if it was right now. And that's the way prophecy works. We must remember the church as a whole has a drive through mentality. Robin and I was talking about this. She said that the other day. She said they have a drive through mentality. Well, that's the truth. We, you know, we have it. Uh, we have a McDonald's attitude. The church now has a McDonald's attitude. Well, just give me that happy meal. Give me that meal. Make me happy. I just want a happy meal. Give me the meal that makes me, oh, don't forget my toy. I got to have a toy with my happy meal. And they hand you some kind of manufactured beef with some kind of manufactured fake cheese and, and, and a bun that if you set it up on a shelf, it don't even look like it changes for weeks maybe. Or months. And you think, man, look what good food that is. It's not even a one sign of decay on it. <laughs> really? You're going to put that in you, right? And so it, so the church has that. They go through the drive through God, Holy Ghost, is anybody there? And you expect the Holy Ghost to come with his earpiece on and say, can I help you? Yes. I want a great blessing today. And I want it without me doing anything for it. And I want it on sale. So I'm going to pay you. Give me a great blessing. And I don't forget my toy. And you expect the Holy Ghost to say, do you want fries with that? Well, it don't happen. But the church has that kind of attitude. And they think that it should happen just like this. Just like this. Hallelujah. But then the interpretation of a prophecy, what's wrong is not the prophecy. It's the interpretation of the prophecy a lot of times. And get this, it's, prof it's interpreted through the eyes of arrogance with a drive-through mentality. The interpretation is looked at through denominational arrogance. Or church, uh, church around your living room table arrogance. In other words, a prophecy must be a Baptist interpretation, or a Methodist interpretation, or a Pentecostal interpretation, or a fivefold ministry interpretation. That means it must be interpreted by an apostle uh, interpretation, a prof prophet interpretation, evangelist interpretation, or a pastor in or teacher interpretation. When the scripture plainly says the scripture is of no private interpretation. But everybody has to have it. Well, it, wasn't, it, it didn't come to pass according to my Baptist interpretation. Well, thank God. Well, it didn't come to pass according to my Pentecostal interpretation. Well, Pentecostals have some of the stinkingest traditions of any of them. And so we have to understand something. It don't come the way you were raised thinking this, should, this prophecy should take place. It's going to come the way God says it's going to come. But rest assured, my friend, it will come. Hallelujah. Private interpretation is what, it's prophecy. And it must be, now listen to the, the scriptures of no private interpretation. And what is prophecy but the scripture in fluid motion? The scripture is of no private interpretation. And what is a prophetic word but the scripture in fluid motion? That's what it is. Hallelujah. 
So we have to understand these things. We have to start looking at prophecy this way. We have to hold fast our confession of faith, just like that rudder on a ship. We can't quit saying what God said. And people look at, at prophets, well, they said this and it didn't happen yesterday. You're going through the McDonald's drive through is what you're doing right now. And you're not thinking about anybody but yourself. You're not thinking about the millions of people that this thing is about to affect. We have to turn it and get rid of corruption as it turns. And that's the way it has to work. Hallelujah. Now, you know, I, the Lord said this to me, and I, I wrote this down. I said, how many more babies must die before this nation turns? How many of the unborn must die? before the nation turns. That is determined by how much error the people of that nation got into and sowed for. Because they sowed seeds so deep that even when you pass no Roe v. Wade anymore, they're still aborting children night and day. That's because the seeds are so deep that the nation got in that kind of error. And you've got voices like the LGBTQ screaming, standing up, acting like they're aborting a child in front of a crowd. Take a bloody wrapped up doll or something and drop it out of their body in front of a crowd and try to show people that this is what they're doing. I, I spoke in front of the Supreme Court uh, courthouse in D.C. one day with a group uh, for uh, uh, pro-life or, you know, against abortion. And right after we left there, they told me, they said three women got up and took abortion pills in front of the crowd and aborted their children right in front of everybody. Now, what kind of degenerated, degraded minds would do such a thing? Hey, you know, this, this, uh, this unclean lifestyle of homosexuality, that's, that's really clean. Is it? You ever watched a parade? They come down through there, grown men with leather thongs. Grown men with some kind of ball stuck in their mouth and a gag around their mouth going down watching, doing lewd sex acts in front of children standing on the side of the road. That's really wholesome. And you've got one of them in the cabinet right now in the, land, in the highest offices in this land running certain departments. Men with wigs that look like clowns standing up trying to tell everybody what to do and ask the Supreme Court Justice, do you know what a woman is? Can you define woman? Well, no. Well, then shut up. You don't even know what a woman is. You are supposed to be one, you know. You could have said me. Oh, well. It depends on how much error that nation gets into and sowed for. When that time runs out, the ship will be turned. And murderers like the Democrat Party that are in office, killing the unborn. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. That's what will happen. But this ship is turning slow. And that's why you see it's corruption remaining, corruption remaining, corruption remaining. Hallelujah. Once we returned and we declared nationally that we have returned, once it's been prayed and stood on, and we stood and fight for the whole nation, it should be preached from that point on. It should be. We don't have to be revisit that. We've already done that. We've done that. Even the president that was in office at that time gave his, gave his blessing on that. And we called for the return, and we repented, and we stood, and we returned. Why go back and start trying to do it again? Why don't we say that day it turned by God, and we won't turn, we won't turn loose of that? And just keep it moving. I'm going to tell you something. Corruption's afraid of a consistent church. Corruption's afraid of a church who won't change its confession. Evil is afraid, darkness is afraid of light that refuses to go out. 
The enemy's afraid of a non-compromising church. So for the, when we did it, we believed it. And now we need to go and tell it. And that's the way it should be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Brother Robin, that's why you make so many enemies is because you talk so bold. You know, here's the thing. I don't hate anybody. I'm not mad at anybody. I, I don't like the devil. I, I hate him. He hates me. There ain't no love lost. And I'll tell you something else, too. I don't like tyranny, and I don't like corruption. I don't like these things. And anybody that gets all bent out of shape and mad, you know, isn't it something that, that everybody that I, if I speak about something or I speak about an event or I speak about a group of people that I know is causing a lot of darkness and turmoil in this nation. Oh, they just get bent out of shape. Oh, we hate him. Oh, we ought to silence him. Oh, we got to do this. Oh, we got to do that. Even the church. Well, he's a false this. And I, I can't stand to hear him talk. I, can't, I don't like his leather coat. I don't like his this. I may not like your duck boots either. But I don't get on the air and talk about them. I mean, that may not be something I wear. But you didn't give me this coat. God gave it to me. Take it up with him. And so here is the thing. I, but I don't get on there and get bent out of shape. And they talk about us like a dog. But I don't get up here and start plotting, scheming, trying to shut everybody up. Then why do they? Why does these dark organizations want to shut up righteousness? I don't get on the air and try to shut them up. They talk about us like a dog. They run us down. I mean, they're constantly trying to hurt us. People are. But I don't get up here and talk about them. I stay with the word and talk about darkness and light, darkness and light, darkness and light. Yeah, but you say Democrat Party. Yeah, well, if it quit being so dark, I wouldn't talk about it. I don't know about you, but killing the unborn's dark. But it's hard to get a church to stand up against darkness when they can't quit dressing their children up like demons and sending them door to door on Halloween. That's hard to do. Man, we don't want to speak out against the darkness, Brother Robin, because I dressed my child up like an axe murderer on Halloween. I like to put bloody handprints on my windows at Halloween so that it looks like somebody got mutilated trying to get out of my house. Well, it's hard to get people like that to speak out against corruption because they're dark-minded. Yeah. Well, hallelujah anyway. Now, today, Robin, if you'll come and play just a moment for me. I, I had some prophetic words that the Lord impressed me today to give. And I don't, I don't do this a lot anymore, uh, but I do if I'm impressed to. And the Lord said today, yeah, just uh, whatever you'd like to. Hallelujah. I heard this. I heard this this morning. I heard the name Amanda Lewis or Loomis. I'm not sure if which one it was, but. And then I heard the word cripple. I don't know if you're crippled in your body or crippled in your mind or you're just broken. But today the Lord wants to deliver you. He's come to you to let you know you're on his mind. Amanda. And I, I don't know if it's Lewis or Loomis. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. But he wants you to know that whatever crippled you, whether your body or your mind or in your life, if it was just a crippled life that should have been so much more than you see right now. The Lord has come to you today to restore to you the years the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm has eaten. 
I heard that name. I don't know anybody by that name. I heard it in my spirit. And so take courage. And don't entertain suicide or anything like that. You're going to miss the greatest part of your life you've ever seen in just a little while. I heard the name Ron. Ron. I wrote it R-O-N, Ron. I said, you seem to be losing, but he is going to win and start winning. So take courage with that. The Lord is bringing a good word to you to take hold of of light and courage. Hallelujah. I heard this. I heard the name Milford. Milford. I'm not sure how you spell it, but I spelled at it. Milford. Then I heard the name James. Now, I don't know if it's a Milford James or if it's two people here. But I heard something about a leg. And it may be Milford or James. But then I heard this, a last name, leg. Leg, maybe lag, I don't know. But I heard that today. I've never heard a last name like leg. I wrote it with two G's. But it's, It's yours. James Leg or maybe Lag. Your mother's name is Ruby or Ruth. Or maybe Rachel, I heard. Or somebody, Rachel, you know too. You know all of these women. Rise up in victory and let your voice be heard. Talk about your victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone named Ron has a brace on your leg. Then I heard Tate or Tatum. Then I heard the word Rigby. And I may be hearing this because it's it's out there from me. It's not someone's not standing here. I may have heard this. that someone was injured from rugby. And so if that's you, the Lord has you on his mind today. The Lord has you on his mind, and he is is looking to heal your body today. Start taking courage and just stand up and start shouting your victory. I heard the name... Melinda Bonner. And this is something about your marriage. And the Lord is going to take care of all of that for you. Hallelujah. Then I heard an Eckenrod or an Eldridge. Then I heard the name Cox. Someone... uh, Someone this is what I heard, is milking you for everything you've got. And I heard, stop the milking. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And those are some personal things I heard today. I heard this, that... I heard a a boom and something about Pakistan, Pakistan. And then I heard this boom, a terrible truck thing, something about a roadside. This current administration, Joe Biden, it's sealed. You're on your own now. You're on your own. 
You're on your own for whatever decisions y'all are going to make. I don't know what it is, but you're on your own now. And then I heard they're forming alliances. I don't know if it's the same people. I just say what I hear. There's alliances being formed for what they assume will be World War III. And then I heard the Lord say this, and I wrote this down. Try. You would rather live your life. This is just personal. Try. You would rather live your life with a purpose instead of ending it with regret. So try. Try. God has a purpose. Live your life with a purpose instead of ending it with regret. Now, people may say, well, what is this turning your back on, God turning his back? Yes, because after a while, people, whatever they're planning on doing, he's not helping them. He's not going to help them. And so that just means someone's on their own now. So you'll rise and fall according to your own merits now. It's just up to everybody. You know, it's, it's, you should, people should have known it can only go so far. And then the hand of the Lord removes protection. And then it just starts. So pray for who you need to pray for. And pray for mercy. But things have begun now. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, it's been a good 11th hour. It's been encouraging. It's been sobering. It, it you know, it moved me. I laughed, I cried, it moved me. And so I want you today to be moved. Be moved. Yes, yes, some of you just, some of you have been wondering, should I move? You've been praying to God. Should I move? The Lord just gave you a word, didn't he? Hallelujah. So whatever that means to you, I don't know what that is, and I don't know, well, Brother Rob told me to move to Milwaukee. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. You heard the word move, and the Lord said, I uh, gave you a confirmation, but you determined Milwaukee. Is you an old Milwaukee? I got you into that. Wasn't Brother Robin. You know, people do that stuff a lot. But I heard the Lord say, when he said move, it's time to move, and someone was seeking him on a, a word to move. You need to be where you're celebrated. You don't need to be where you're tolerated. Amen. Praise God. Come on, Krista. Receive our offering today. Just jump in with this mic and start splashing the water around and just turn over the tables of money changers and just, you're good at that. And just flip them right over and tell the people what, what the real Jesus talks about, what he wants them to do and how he has made us a way to prosper that does not depend on the economy, right. on what politicians do, on what the stock market does. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All according to his mighty word. Amen. Amen. Well, to add what he, to what he just said, <laughs> make me think it's summertime, jumping in the water, splashing around. Ooh, I'm ready for some, some sunshine. Amen. Here comes the sun. <laughs> Now you're all singing it. I I know. That's a hey. That's a great song. It's a very positive song. You know, Sunday at Church International was just amazing. It was a celebration. What I call is Jesus' second birthday, and so we we celebrate our our two major holidays as believers is Christmas and Resurrection Day. And so Sunday, we got to celebrate with all of our Church International family. If you didn't get a chance to watch that service, go back and watch it. It was so powerful. I had somebody tell me yesterday, I have taken communion my entire life. And uh, especially coming from a denominational background, they said, you know, I've taken it all my life once a month in their particular denomination. They said it had never been more meaningful until Sunday. And so go go back and, and watch that. And if you are 
if you're in need of healing in your body and if you're in need of healing in your finances and healing in every area uh, every, every area and aspect of your life go back and and listen to that communion message take communion uh, enter into that take communion over over what where you have if you've messed up somewhere in your life whether spiritually physically financially you've messed up Go before the Lord. Make it right again. He has mercy and grace. His mercies are renewed every single day. And so all you have to do is just go before the Lord. And I'm not saying communion is, is, the, is the way you have to take communion to do that. No, you could just go before the Lord and say, Lord, I repent. Forgive me. But just as a symbolic sign of, hey, I'm... This is, I'm consecrated to this. I'm doing this. Get it under the blood in remembrance of what he did for you. And, and yes, like Amber said, you seal it. So go back and watch that. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to get views up. I'm telling you, go back and watch it. And so today, as you're getting, as you do that, and, and if you don't want to, that's fine. But I want to let you know, and I'm putting in your password to your phone on my phone. I don't even know why. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm doing that. You know, when, when you get up to minister, you have so many things running through your mind at one time. And you, you have to make the decision as you're talking sometimes, God, I got to get out of this right here into the spirit but yet you've got your mind in the background going hey so next tuesday at three o'clock <laughs> this these are this is what's trying to go uh through your head and you're like no no i gotta walk in the spirit <laughs> and you can tell i was not in my natural thinking right then to put my own password in but going back to last sunday it it, it reminded me of this I spoke on Galatians 3, 13 and 14 where it said Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Well, in the message translation, it says Christ redeemed us from that self-defeating, which means the majority of defeat that we experience in our own life came from... We're the ones that caused it. By disobeying God, doing something you knew good and well, he didn't say do, or get, giving in to that natural mind and flesh. But he redeemed us from that, so when we, are, when we go before him and call upon grace and mercy, we'll be forgiven, we'll be saved. But it's a self-defeating life is what the curse is. A self-defeating it gets you to defeat yourself because as a believer, the enemy, a blood-bought believer, an enemy cannot defeat you. He's not big enough to defeat you. The only being that can defeat you is you. And so that's the way the enemy gets us to defeat. It gets us in that place of defeat is to defeat ourselves. And so it says, but Christ has redeemed us from that self-defeating. See, now we're in this world, but we're not of this world once we become believers. So, so now the curse is invalid. That, their point is invalid. We don't, have to, we don't have to live under the curse anymore because Christ redeemed us from that. The anointed one in his anointing says, do you remember the scripture that says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree? This is what happened when Jesus was nailed to the cross. Now that, look, this is when it happened. When he was nailed to the cross, he became a curse. He actually became the curse itself so that he could redeem you and I from it. But it says, it says, by absorbing it into his body, he absorbed the curse. So when he hung on that cross, he was like 
an attraction for the curse. And the curse from every area of the world, the north, south, east, and west, all of a sudden took notice that Jesus had his faith out there for you and I to pull that towards him. And all of a sudden the curse turned and where it was headed towards you and I that day for the rest of our life, all of a sudden something stopped it in its tracks and it turned and saw Jesus. And here it came. And every bit of it. Want to know why the earth grew dark? The curse invaded the earth and was headed towards one man. And he stood there. He hung there and absorbed every bit of it. And when he came out of the tomb, we were talking about coming out of the tomb. When he came out of the tomb, and that's not fake news, he did. He rose from the dead. He went down into hell, paid the price, rose the dead, alive right now at this moment and the moments to come. When he came out, he left the curse where it belonged in hell and he came out as the blessing itself. And then he redeemed us at that moment from the curse. And what is poverty? It's the curse. The curse is living beneath what God paid for. The curse is living beneath, like my mom said Sunday, living beneath the blood. That's what the curse is. And the enemy would love for you to think for the rest of your days that that blood didn't lift you up at all or redeemed you from anything. But this book right here says that he redeemed you from the curse, which is everything the curse entails, by being made a curse himself. And so today you can walk in what he paid for. You can walk in the power of the blood, not beneath it. You walk in it, and it's immune to everything. The blood is immune to everything in this world. It can't touch it. Why? Because the blood defeated it. It defeated every part of the curse. Death, hell, and the grave. And it is your shield around you from poverty, from sickness, from defeat, from depression, not just physical sickness. It delivered you from mental sickness. And it is your freedom today. It's your freedom from everything. And number one, it's your freedom from spending eternity in hell. You don't have to do that. It wasn't created for you. It wasn't created. The enemy Never created anything. He didn't even create hell. Hell was created for him and his angels. It wasn't created for you and I. And you don't have to go there. All you got to do is just say, Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And just to say something else, you say, take my life and do something with it. That's your first step to ultimate prosperity. Now you're redeemed from the curse and everything it tries to put on you. And now you have the authority to speak God's word over every area of your life just as he spoke it. You sound like him to the curse when you speak his word. And all it remembers is that day that the curse was defeated. And so when we hold up our finances and we stand strong on the word of God, just something that represents your finances. Most of you give, you, you give online, so hold up your phone. Hold up something. Just hold, hold your wallet up. Just something that represents it. And speak God's word over it. Speak Luke 6.38, that as you give... It shall be 
given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tither, the devourer is rebuked for your sake. The devourer is a part of the curse, and it's been defeated, and the Lord makes sure of it when, when you're a tither. He makes sure. He says, I'll rebuke it. And don't you know that it trembles, the devourer, when the Lord says, no, you are rebuked, shunned. You are shunned. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done, in Jesus' name, amen. Dad, back to you. Hallelujah. Well, there you have it. Stirring the water up, teaching us how to prosper God's way. Amen. You know, you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives you the utterance or tells you what to say. What is the difference in that? Well, it's like this. Just suppose that you're someone is out in the, you know, um, a policeman is standing out in the road and directing traffic and he's got a badge on that gives him authority that gives him real authority now he don't have the power in his physical body to stop those cars but he holds his hands up and they just stop and they'll stop they stop because of the power that backs that badge well here is the thing too but now if they didn't want to stop they could just keep on rolling and uh, be in a lot of trouble, but it would they'd keep on rolling. But that officer also has a cannon on his hip. And that cannon now, he, he has the power to stop you. So now here is the thing. Or you could even take and put him in, a, in an Abrams tank and pull out there and he just turns that barrel around toward you and says, stop. Well, bless God, you'll stop. Why? Because now he not only has the authority, but he has the power to, to blow you off the road if necessary. This is the way it is when you get saved. You have the authority of the Word of God backing you, every word. But when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and the man of fire comes to live on the inside of you, you not only have authority, you have power within you. When you speak the Word of God, it'll blow that devil out of your way if necessary. And that's just the way it is. So you want to ask Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Ghost today with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. People say, why is that the, uh, uh, the initial evidence? Well, it's not the only evidence, but it is the initial evidence because the power of life and death is in the power of the tongue. So you're yielding the most powerful member of your being to the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. And you have to trust Him by faith for every syllable. So right now, why don't you say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives me the utterance. I receive it now, and I praise you for it, Lord, for this baptism in the Spirit. And I just thank you for it, Lord, and just begin to praise him out loud. you got to talk now. Praise him out loud. He's going to give the utterance, but you got to do the speaking. And then whatever sounds you hear, just go from praising and then suddenly, and just start letting it come out. 
e riaparando gora se con gele chi aprì se le parato rode a ravarande che le hosse in galesi ha chesne o prodo che risile e riaprendo gara in gengale si chi aprì to rode and here it comes just rolling out of your mouth well now you can pray in English and you should but when you run out of something to say or you don't know what to pray in English when you shift over into that language and the Holy Ghost will take hold together with you against your infirmities because it knows what to pray for that we don't. Hallelujah. He'll help us pray as we ought. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you today. I want you to know that we love you. Jesus loves you so much more. And, and never forget this statement. Take it with you everywhere you go. God is absolutely good. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.